Hi, I'm Giora Brile, uh, Senior Vice President of eMusica, um, a company that works in the Latin record business. We uh, produce, well, we have a number of labels, I should say. Uh, one, we own a, a compilation label called ProTel Records, which was started in 1996 and kind of patterned after uh, KTEL, meaning a television-driven compilation label. Uh, compilation label means where uh, a, you bring out products, where you license tracks from other record companies under a concept and you market it. So that's a compilation label, meaning most likely no original recordings. Um, <clears throat> then we also owned and merged in 99 with a regional Mexican label called Sound Mex, uh, which was uh, founded and run by, and is run by Bob Griever. Bob Griever is uh, a giant in the industry. His grandmother was Maria Griever, uh, one of the greatest songwriters, uh, certainly in Latin America. She wrote Hurame, the music to What a Difference a Day Makes, uh, because she grew up in a bilingual home in Mexico. So at home, she's, they were speaking English, and of course, outside in school and so on, Spanish. So that's why she could do so well writing music also in English. And her son, Carlos Griva, founded Mexico's largest publishing company, Griva Music. And then his son, Bob Griva, is our partner, who had... Um, a record label called Cara Records, C-A-R-A, -A, uh, and he signed Selena when she was 12. And uh, subsequently, a few years ago, uh, sold his label that included La Mafia, a great uh, Tejano act, David Lee Garza, Mass. He was kind of the king of Tejano music. And uh, subsequently also he sold <coughs> Griva Music to... Uh, Clive Calder's company, Jive and Zomba, and uh, started Soundmex uh, as a regional Mexican so label so that more of Griva music could be recorded. And uh, in the process of doing that, so um, a number of Jive acts hit and made it real big, like Backstreet Boys and, and uh, In Sync and so on. So they kind of lost interest <laughs> to do regional Mexican. Anyway, so that's SoundMix and ProTel is the foundation of our company. And then in 99, um, our current CEO, Stuart Livingston, um, had a brilliant idea, and that is to create what they call a, a roll-up, a financial roll-up, where you buy music assets and on the theory you buy one, two, and three, and maybe that adds up to five. Or as they say, um, the whole was larger than the sum of the parts in this case, to draw an analogy from Gestalt psychology. Um, and we acquired, after many years of trying, um, the Fania label, world-class uh, salsa label and tropical music label, Many people compare Fania to Motown, what Motown was for African Americans and really for the rest of the world, not just African Americans. Fania is for in the tropical Latin music. And also, quite recently, Cubane, um, a company that was founded originally in Cuba by Mateo San Martin, and then obviously political. Um, occurrences led him to the United States and he started um, Kubane here with emphasizing a lot of a &R in merengue which is a dance that uh, comes like so many maybe all tropical music via Africa and the Dominican Republic uh, so most of the Caribbean Afro-Caribbean rhythms have African DNA, as I like to call it. So that's what today eMusica is, and we're in the process of growing and working hard, trying to bring good products to uh, an ever-growing market.
you can dissect many, many things 20 different ways. Um, and at times that's artificial. It's what, for instance, the INS does with people. They call people Hispanics. I never met a Hispanic. Did you ever meet a Hispanic? I only know Mexicans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, etc. So meaning music is arbitrarily separated or boxed, if you want. And in the Latin business, in the United States, due to the size of the population, Mexican population, or p people that ethnically have uh, roots in Mexico, regional Mexican is the largest group. Um, the U.S. Latin population is about 60 percent uh, Mexican, uh, ethnically of ethnic origin. And if you add to it, in some sense, some of the Central American countries, because they, for many, many years, have been dominated by Mexican television fare, there's maybe another 12 percent. So it's a predominant segment, regional Mexican. Then you have the so-called tropical music, which is music, as I mentioned to you before, uh, Afro-Caribbean, and that has various genres, the predominant ones being salsa, merengue, bachata, cumbia, uh, etc. I mean, it's, it's kind of endless. Um, and pop, the third one, which is pop balada. Okay? But as I said to you, you need to be careful with these uh, boxing. They're somewhat artificial. Okay, so anyway, and the Latin market, the Latin U.S. record market, represents approximately 6% of the U.S. record market and is growing very, very fast um, because more and more Latin people are here. They influence in the way in their lifestyle in the intermingling between friends and schools and so on so um, as a matter of fact i think that the the latin cultural influence will be the most predominant influence in the next 30 years if we make it for the next 30 years um, very important in the american fabric some people like it some people don't but you know water flows down the mountain so Maybe the, the shortest way to explain this is that um, when I was a kid and didn't finish my high school because I was extremely dys dyslexic, and today I guess they would say I had ADD and all those fancy things, um, I asked my mother to let me go to art school because that's what I've always been attracted to. Instead of going to school, I'd go to the museum in Cologne, for instance, and I became sort of a junior expert on Van Gogh and I uh, found him fascinating, Gauguin, etc., because there was a lot of passion in his painting, or there is a lot of passion in his painting. And um, it was much more interesting than this school business. And uh, But my mother said, no, you're going to be a bohemian, and she basically, after three days of Rorschach test and memory test, they made me take that over twice because they thought I cheated, because I learned by memory. Uh, they said advertising you should go into advertising. So that's what I did. And I started at McKen Erickson in Cologne. And after a year, I thought, oh, no, advertising, you got to go to the United States. So I immigrated. But now I'm finally doing what I wanted to do as a kid. I'm an art dealer, which is the best way, I think, to be in the record business. So because you deal really as you, I think we as record people should be responsible for the artist as art dealers and not just as maximizing your bottom line. <laughs> um, you know, there are great uh, historic um, examples of art dealers that have been very uh, important in, in the cultural life of, uh, of Europe, certainly. I came to the United States in 1964 with, with a boat, a one-way ticket, and $500 and started my advertising career in New York. I worked at McCann in the mailroom first, then in traffic, then I worked at Doyle Dane, then a, in, a, in a cigarette company, and finally in, at Pepsi-Cola, Pepsi-Cola International in 1970, I joined them. And at, I was director of creative services there. And one of the VPs asked me to develop a program that all the bottlers could, around the world could participate because there would be more synergy. Um, and uh, so 
I thought about, you know, there are certain universal languages like sex, music, and sport, and the first one being obviously not available to Pepsi-Cola. The second one was was not available either, music, because we were coming out of the crazy psychedelic 60s. And Pepsi at that time wasn't ready for it, so we decided sports. What's the biggest sport around the world? Remember, I worked for Pepsi-Cola International, soccer. Who is the greatest soccer player ever? Pele. So I went after Pele, and after six months of running around and following a circus called Santos Football Club, we signed him to Pepsi. And uh, first he was very reluctant and only made an educational agreement. So for one year we ran from Australia to Nigeria, etc., doing clinics and wall charts and how to play books, etc. And we made fantastic films. I'm really proud of that achievement. Pelé, the Master and His Method, mm -hmm. which was six inspirational films uh, showing Pelé and his artistry, but showing the artistry and not just didactic learning. This has to do with my theory that education has to be a conspiracy and not stuffing the bag with facts. So uh, because of the connection with Pelé, I got to know Brazil. I got to know better Latin America. I had to learn to speak Portuguese rather quickly because otherwise I couldn't communicate with Pelé. And I fell in love with Brazil. So uh, we traveled another two or three years around the world again, but then we had more of a more commercial relationship. And one day I got a phone call from uh, Steve Ross's secretary. Steve Ross at the time was the chairman of Warner Communications. And she said, you're Mr. Ross and some of our people would like to have lunch with you. Would you mind joining us? Now, at the time, I lived in the city, so any excuse I had not to go up all the way to Westchester was a good one. And I went to that lunch, and in that lunch was, were interesting people. Nesui Ertegun, Ahmed Ertegun, the founders of uh, WEA, uh, Geffen, Sarnoff, uh, etc. And uh, also two people that I was introduced to, Clive Toy and Phil Wisnam, and I was told they, they have to do with the cosmos. And so after 15 minutes of interrogation as to how is Pelé, what kind of a guy is, they said, well, Pelé told us to talk to you because we want to hire him for the New York Cosmos. And I said, wow, that's great. Because I was thinking of my Pepsi-Cola youth soccer program that would get sort of a shot in the arm. And um, make a long story short, I helped Pelé make the contract. And then the day that he signed, which was, if memory doesn't fail me, June 21, <clears throat> 1975, at Club 21 was, was a mob of press. Um, after the conference was over, the press conference, where they announced Pelé's coming to the United States, Ross, who had a really a great charm, uh, said, well, you brought him here, now you manage him. So I became Pelé's manager, managed him for three years, and then went to Brazil, lived in Brazil, married in Brazil, I uh, have two kids from Brazil, and that's where my Latinization started. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, a gentleman that started Telemundo, the network that now is owned by GE or NBC, called me to, together with Stuart Livingston. Here we revisiting my partner and current CEO. We started Telemundo with a station out in Los Angeles called Channel 52. And um, unfortunately, the people that financed it, Reliance, didn't know anything about operating a TV business, much less a network. network. And uh, basically, we had a fallout with them because they went for a network, whereas we wanted to, at the time, build a super station. It was much more economical and the right way to do it uh, because of program program being expensive to produce and Televisa had such a strong hold and lock on the best programming, Latin programming, that we thought it was better to compete to be a local channel, El Canal de Los Angeles, the channel of Los Angeles. We could have been more relevant and then eventually gone on on the satellite like uh, initially the Turner uh, stations became uh, super stations. So then I went to Univision because of that fallout, and I was a vice president of Univision for six years. 
and as such was responsible for uh, unsold inventory. That's sort of empty airline seats that go by when the plane takes off, the, or, or you know, salads you have to throw out because nobody <laughs> bought them. And uh, I turned that inventory into money. And one of the re ways I found to turn it into money worked with the Latin record industry. Because when I got there, the total expenditure of the record industry, Latin record re industry on Univision was $70,000. That was 1987 the year prior to my arriving there. And when I left them in 93, it was two and a half million dollars. Because the, uh, we made deals with them where we said, they said, well, we don't have any money, we can't afford it. And we said, well, why don't you uh, let us risk the inventory? And if you succeed, terrific, then you pay us a royalty. So that was all done that way. And we promoted Selena and helped her break Selena. Um, and various other acts. It was a fun time. And because of the relationship I had with all the heads of the Latin record companies, and I worked very correct with them and always thinking of their business also, which is a way to do really business. Um, when I then started in 96, they all gave me tracks, which normally they don't do. So that's how I started in the record business. I wasn't initially. I thought uh, it was the, some of the characters I met in this business and some of the values in this business uh, scared me initially. And now I am, yeah. Yeah, I am. Because you, you need to have sort of critical business mass, capital, and so on. I started this com my company, Protel, with $500. So uh, it was hard. You need capital. But you need great ideas, first of all. And maybe I didn't have a great idea, and I just did it through a lot of sweat and hard work, you know. And through also, very, very important, you need to work with a great team. You need to have people with you and around you that just tell you, you know, this is bullshit, Cure, because... As a record person, you, there's a tendency to buy into your own story very easily. So the team in a record company is very important. Mm -hmm. the, the integrity, the creative integrity of people and their dedication. So I could not have done this here without the people that uh, are with us. You know? First of all, it, it, it comes out of the wrong head. And that is, you know, beat up the artist, maximize and the bottom line. That's not the way to work with art. Um, in my view, not everything is sex and rock and roll. I'm sorry. I think there's more to it. And music is very in a cultural um, locomotive. There was somewhat of a learning curve about the record business initially. So we made lots of mistakes <laughs> and learned a lot. And I think today we're in a place where we say, especially with Fania and Kubane, um, quality is the number one objective and in today's fabulous technological um, paradise almost you can take um, timeless recordings but that maybe were recorded say 40 years ago and restore them to, a, to something like, like they've never sounded because uh, as you know, you used to get it on tape, then it was mixed, and so it was then in some kind of a master. And from the master, they would press um, vinyls initially, or, well, very much in the beginning, it was wax, uh, 78s and so on. And then the CDs were invented, and it, it, many times the they mastered, the record companies mastered from the LPs instead of going back to the original... Uh, master and uh, we work with a group of excellent professionals one of them in particular I mean they're all excellent but Bob Katz he's a three-time Grammy winner uh, runs a company out of Orlando called Digital Domain he wrote a book on mastering and uh, is quite uh, obsessed with mastering It's fabulous he's like a rocket science <laughs> He's very, very good, and uh, 
he built his own machines and has still analog machine. I mean, he's really, really careful. And so qualities, I would think, is the number one objective and the number one change. Um, and then you also have to have, I believe, a position as a marketer that respects the customer. Something I learned from TV. If in television you do not respect your viewer, you're not going to get ratings. Now, that sort of sounds banal and kind of simple, but then sometimes the greatest things in life are simple. Because the very words that you use in a promo have to do if you respect the viewer or not. It's that level. You don't look down on your, on your viewer. You don't look up. You treat your viewer with respect. Um, there are a number of examples in, in programming. For instance, you don't make abru abrupt programming changes without letting taking the viewer to that change. Well, it's the same thing um, in in uh, in music. You know, you you need to respect your customer. So, for instance, what we've done with um, Fania, which used to have just one p piece of paper included, sort of like this. This is a sampler, and obviously. I mean, it was just one piece of paper in most of the CDs, and it was fine. They sold a lot of them, and it worked for them. But uh, what we've decided to do is we make liner notes. We have professional people write liner notes, put in pictures so that the new generation knows who was Joe Batan and what did he look like at the time, at least. And it's also important that we have a picture from the time, okay? Liner notes in Spanish and English written by music professors, music ethnomusicologists, journalists, musicians, and so on. And for the very first time, in many cases, we have um, a lineup of musicians. And to the fanatics of salsa, the, the collectors, this is very important to know that this person played the trombone or, or whatever. So that's what we try to do. And we're also bringing out the product at a price that's more accessible than it was in the past. Um, so, better sound, better packaging, better price. And uh, we hope the public responds. You cannot simply, in the record business, throw out a record anymore. It's just the, the physical space in the store is getting... Uh, shorter and shorter, so to speak, because there are less and less retailers uh, around, at least in the, in the bricks and mortar field. So because of the tyranny of the f physical space, you have, and, and all these releases that come out, you have a reduced access. So you better be sure that that access is used well, you know, otherwise your label is perceived by the buyers of these stores as not, not being responsible and not working. So you need to have programs to support the releases either by tv you have to create a buzz i mean there's a whole certain certain technique and and creative process almost involved especially in in launching catalog because we are as yet not a company that um at least in the salsa or tropical music area um uh, signs or maintain uh, you know works with with artists that are active now that, re that are recording most of the Fania All-Stars um, are no longer with Fania label, but their most classical recordings are. So, for one, the purchasing power in this country, the United States, is, uh, tends to be much higher than in many of the Latin American countries. You can sell here a, say, an average whole, uh, retail price for a salsa album catalog uh, is around fifteen dollars uh, whereas in central america it's closer to ten dollars or less so the purchasing power this, this is the richest latin market in the world actually unless you consider spain latin i mean in the western hemisphere at least um, we you have 45 million people here now when we started Telemundo, the INS was finding 29 million, and then it moved to 32 million, and then they recounted, or whatever they did, 
they got rid of their biases and then currently it stands at 39.6 million but we all know there's 45 there are 45 million people here so they can't count i guess our principal distribution system through universal music latino a, the distribution company of universal music group markets in the united states and puerto rico yes yes and we we're making arrangements for uh, Latin American distribution, Asian distribution, and we have a, a partner in Europe. For one, when you are marketing in a large territory, but essentially to a niche, as we said, it was 6% of the U.S. record market. Jazz is 3%, another niche, okay? That forces certain dynamics on you that are different than taking a broad shot, you know, and and promoting U2, for instance, because you have channels that are primary channels. Although even that is changing. Um, you may have heard that the Univision network just, um, I believe last week, uh, produced Premio Lo Nuestro, which is sort of the music industry, radio industry uh, uh, kind of a award ceremony had ratings that uh, topped all other networks in the 18 to 34 year olds. The number one radio station in the United States is called La Mega in New York. The number one local news programming is KMEX in Los Angeles. The number one station in Miami is uh, WLTV Channel 23. So, <laughs> you know, that's really incredible. Yeah, so you, 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 you market. The other thing is that the so called Latin market in the United States, um, you could, in some sense, once again arbitrarily uh, separate, divide, or whatever you want to say, because they are the so called Spanish dominant uh, consumers that really uh, just have in, in, at, in their home and at work speak predominantly Spanish. And then there are many Latinos that, while they prefer to speak Spanish, which comes out always in the surveys, because it's really a biased question. It has much more to do with, with whom do you identify more. So that's the subtext to mm. that question. But many of them are, are Spanish, uh, English dependent. There are Latinos, especially in Texas and sort of the Southwest, that have been there for 150 years. Well, you know, it used to be Mexico anyway. So uh, this, there's a market difference, meaning, for instance, my son Bruno was born in Brazil. He came here when he was five. He still understands and somewhat speaks Portuguese, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with Latin programming. He's totally into the American culture, and that happens with a lot of young Latinos also. So um, it, it, you, you, have to, you have to do your homework. We are looking for what we call recording artists, not just musicians. Let me try to be helpful and try to explain a little bit where this is going. Performing artists are uh, individuals that have, by as the word suggests, some artistry. And that artistry also involves their physical being, their, their, their as they say, for instance, in Spanish or, yeah, or in English, I guess, their angel, how they are perceived, on, how they look on a camera, how they're perceived, can they talk. Many of the younger um, uh, striving um, uh, performers can't even conduct an interview. Some of them can, and those are the ones that, that project. So you have, to look just be, you have to look beyond just the craft of being a musician. So it's a complex issue. It's the appearance, it's how you come across, um, how creatively connected you are to your essence because it comes across, especially in today's medium of television. Television doesn't lie, so to speak. So, um, first, I think, as a musician, you need to really be a virtuoso, you know, a craftsman. And then, uh, if you are a singer 
or a singer songwriter um, you develop your own style and uh, uh, bring out uniqueness something special something uh, I ha I was asked at a seminar two years ago the same question and I always said look the sperm always makes it to the egg now we all know there are millions of them that don't but anyway you know otherwise we would be finished as a human uh, race so mm. that's kind of how musicians have to they have just got to get there and they have to be prepared um and and centered essentially centered mm. in expressing whatever they want to express see what at least my experience has been for for record ex executives what they look for very often is does this person just want to be famous or does this person want to express herself or hi himself I'm not interested in people that want to be famous. Okay. They, they don't contribute anything. So it's kind of, do you have something to say? Do you have to, some way to say it uniquely? Shakira, I tell you in a personal experience. Um, I was program director of WAPA Channel 4 in Puerto Rico. And I was invited to a conference in L.A. called Radio y Musica. And <clears throat> basically that's where record labels presented their upcoming stars, kind of a showcase, first showcase. And on stage comes this rather short, somewhat plump, dressed horribly in brown pants and a, and a strange blouse girl, and she starts singing. And I turned to my, the person next to me, I said, so basically said, who is that? You know, really kind of not believing anything. When she was finished, I jumped up and I clapped and I became like a fan. I went backstage because she had something to say and her way of doing this was unique. And that was her, her songs, Pierre Descalzo, her, her really milestone album that gave her the breakthrough because she had something to say. What they made out of her later is another commercial question. But, you know, here's an example. Well, you, you have to make a, a demo. I mean, the musician has to make... It's not just a musician. It's a songwriter, a, a singer. If you are a singer-songwriter, you have a much better chance than just being a singer. Unless you have very unique qualities as a singer. Your voice, your appearance, your, your style of... Your, the way you carry a song. Um, you, so, as in, let's say, as an artist or as a wannabe artist, you need to first make demos. And um, the demos not necessarily have to be um, super quality or invest and go to very expensive studios. Um, some artists just make their demos at home. So good A&R people find the, the, the art that's there or is not. So... Um, you know, you don't need to start with a with a name of a group. That's another thing. It's like starting a business with a business card. No, you need to start a business with a client. So it's the same thing. You need to start wanting to be an artist. You need to start with something you have to offer. And uh, too many people get confused about it. They think they have to spend, you know, 10, 12, whatever, $20,000 to make a... I think the real, at least if I were an artist, I would want to be with an A&R guy that heard what I had to offer, which wasn't necessarily, you know, a Rolls Royce the way it was produced. Right. Yeah. Right. That's the label's job. They have to do your homework. It's a business that at the, on the outside looks glamorous. It's not. It is and it isn't. It's a nickel and dime business like just many other businesses. And the pennies count. Uh, yet it's a bi business where I think maybe the most important element you need to have is really a liking, a passion for it. If you don't, you, you can't do these crazy hours and, and be as dedicated to this uh, physically and mentally uh, if you don't really like the music business. Mm.